Well, good morning and welcome once again to Elevenses. I'm Kevin Williams of Survival Skills Rider Training. This is my twice weekly webcast. It's uh, Wednesday, 10th of August. This is show 261. And as you notice, I haven't actually got my virtual background up today. Um, it worked perfectly um, just a few days ago. And of course, today something has changed and it won't work. Um, anyway, never mind. Um, We'll crack on regardless. Now, I've got a fair amount to get through, even in what is a short show whilst I'm on holiday. Um, rural speed limits are to be reduced to 20 miles per hour in parts of Surrey. That's a scary thought. Speeding bikers, however, are a threat to safety in New York. Urban rodeos in France have resulted in a critical injury to a 10-year-old girl playing in an, a pedestrian area. We'll have a look at those two problems because they are kind of linked. Um, it's an end of an era as the GSXR um, has more or less vanished from Suzuki UK's website. And with a range of just 80 miles, the Baron Anubis Cruise Across won't offer much adventure, even though it looks like an adventure bike. Um, quick uh, flagging out really of some iffy advertising um, is a an exhaust approved for circuit use? Uh, well, that's a question to answer, isn't it? Uh, and finally, today's better biking tip, I'll go back to looking at the Essex police tweet that basically said, don't filter because it's dangerous and try and look at the problems objectively. So settle yourselves down for the next 30 odd minutes or so whilst I run through the rest of the show. Now, don't forget, we do have some dates for the diary which i would like you to add um whoops that's the wrong button i've just pressed let's try to get the right button pressed as i said i'm um, struggling again with yet another change of um software which i don't get fed up with it, it always causes problems right that was the wrong photograph i'm still struggling here right so anyway what i was trying to show you was in fact the uh, it's a series of events that I have lined up, which include some uh, live talk events. I'm covering riding systems and I am covering the science of being seen in depth. Those dates are first Wednesdays in both cases for the months of September and October, respectively. Those online events go out uh, at 8 p.m. in the evening. Tickets are a fiver. You can find the uh, full details on the Survival Skills HQ uh, page where I can do the ticketing nice and easily. The other event is a completely free one. This was the picture I was trying to get up. It's the Emergency Services Day, which is happening at the Route 1066 Cafe, which is just outside Roberts Bridge. So it's on the way down to Hastings, um, hence the Route 1066 moniker. That is August the 18th. It's a fairly short uh, event. It's uh, happening over lunchtime. Um, so if you can come along and uh, say hi, I will be down there. I'll be talking about science of being seen. Um, various other emergency services will be there. And the whole event is supported by Moto Gusto. I forgot to give uh, John Allsop a short a shout for that last time I was online. And the There'll be fundraising on behalf of Blood Bikes and also the Dock Bike um, project, which I think is definitely a worthwhile one. So if you do get a chance, do pop along um, and meet me down at the cafe, 10, Route 1066 Cafe near Roberts Bridge on Thursday the 18th over the lunch break. All right, now. First bit of news, um, many of us probably ridden or driven across areas like Dartmoor and Devon or Ashdown Forest, actually, in between Kent and Sussex, that have lower than average speed limits. They've dropped the limits on those roads to 40 miles per hour in both cases. Now, the Surrey Hills are officially classified as an area of outstanding natural beauty, and they cover around 80 square miles of land south of the A25, uh, roughly from Guildford to Dorking, south of London. Now, the good news is they are well worth taking some time to explore. It's a beautiful countryside. Um, the bad news, however, is that the uh, a recent or a proposal will ensure that you do actually have plenty of time to actually investigate the area because Surrey County Council are proposing 
to lower the speed limit on some of those roads to as little as 20 miles per hour. Um, now, why? Well, the obvious answer, of course, is road safety, as well as 20 zones. Some of the other roads will be reduced to 30. And this is thought to be a UK first. Um, so I didn't provide details of just when this trial will begin um, at this particular stage, other than sometime later this year. Um, I'll come back to that um, on another date, actually, when I think about it. Um, now, the problem with speed limits, of course, is that fairly obviously it all depends on getting people to obey them. Now, across the big pond in New York, Mayor Eric Adams has used his recent campaign for office to argue that both the city and state need to crack down on illegal riding. And targets have been dirt bikes and ATVs. Uh, they have been seizing illegal uh, motorcycles across the country. Back in June, you may recall, I had a story where he was actually uh, joined by joining uh, NYPD officials at a Brooklyn Auto Pound, whilst 92 bikes were actually uh, run over by a bulldozer to destroy them. And he said at the time that the NYPD have actually taken 900 motorcycles and uh, quads off the city streets this year already. And that's almost double the number that uh, was seized to the same point in 2021. Now, one of other the other uh, campaign promises that Mayor Andrews actually made was that there would be more effective use of speed cameras, which presumably means more cameras. Now, it seems that post lockdown, more than one third of people riding motorized two wheelers, and that appears to include the, the sort of um, pedal pedal x that we're used to seeing over here as well as high powered electric bicycles which are operated by a twist grip which are actually legal for use in the uk but again are common sight on our road as well as light electric motorcycles and in some cases conventional ICE engined bikes, which are all being used on New York's protected bike lanes and what they call greenways. And the trouble is that these are shared with cyclists and even in sometimes with pedestrians in certain cases. And it seems they have a 25 mile per hour speed limit on them. That's about the top end of what most cyclists could actually manage, actually. Um, so anyway, New York Post, they sent out a team of journalists equipped with radar guns to see what people were actually doing in terms of speed. And what they found was of the 486 two-wheelers that they radared, 167 of them, 34%, were exceeding the 25 mile per hour maximum. And some bikes were caught traveling as quick as 35 miles an hour. And they also spotted the these unregistered dirt bikes and quads which are outlawed on the city streets, being used in these lanes. Now, as I said, almost um, a considerable number of these riders were actually over the speed limit. It was almost one in, in three on the Williamsburg Bridge. But they reported that the biggest issues were on the Queensborough Bridge, where 18% of the motorised bikes were exceeding the limit. And the difference, I said here, is that they're not just sharing this bike lane with cyclists, it's being shared with pedestrians too. So locals are saying that the enforcement of the problem by the NYPD is non-existent. A NYPD spokesman said that they do conduct traffic enforcement based on the conditions present at any one time, and that they are also engaged in education awareness initiatives. Now, um, don't forget, if you do have a question or a comment on the thing you want to say on the show, I will try to get back to you during the show. Uh, I'll also try to get back to you at the end of it, although as I'm off out in a minute to continue my holiday, um, I probably won't answer immediately. Um, but uh, yeah, do drop me a line. I'm always interested to hear what people have to say. Um, Nick, Clive and Kevin have all looked in. So good to see you. Um, now, next story sort of it kind of follows on from the one I've just talked about. Oh, well, Nigel's just looked in as well. Morning, Nigel. Um, a common sight in the US is what's become called the urban rodeo. Now, these are riders, often younger riders, sometimes teenagers, um, and that they kind of gather together in big groups. And the idea is that they 
you know, that they sort of, I suppose the simple answer is that they show off to each other and to anybody who happens to be looking in di their direction. So the sort of thing you'll see uh, in these YouTube videos are prolonged wheelies, um, you know, stoppy stunts, uh, motocross bikes um, are often used, but so are quads. And of course, these meetups are all unofficial. They all happen on the public road. And many of the riders uh, seem to have no license and many are riding unregistered or even illegal for use on the road bikes. Now, predictably, they attract police attention when the police spot them, uh, hence why New York police have been seizing and crushing these bikes. Um, but another country which has a significant problem with these kind of events is actually France. Now, I mentioned a couple of months ago that the director, Lola Quiveron, had won an award for a film called Rodeo at the Cannes Film Festival this May. It's the first French film about these riders, and she called it a social phenomenon. Well, it may be a social phenomenon, but it is also a problem. These uh, urban rodeos are common around Paris, and police frequently home in on illegal gatherings of unregistered bikes. And to give you an idea of the scale of the issue, in the Val d'Oise department, which is north of Paris, there were 534 police interventions for urban rodeos, which have, have taken place since April this year. 37 people have been arrested, 34 bikes seized. Now, I guess for many people it seems like a bit of fun, but there is a serious side to these events. They often cause casualties to innocent passers-by. Now, the latest happened last week as a 10-year-old girl was actually hit by a motocross bike whilst she played in a pedestrianized, pedestrianized area of a housing estate northeast of Paris in Pontoise. And the incident happened just after 9 p.m. on Friday night. Two children were playing, the 10-year-old girl and an 11-year-old boy. They were apparently playing catch beneath their apartment building and they were hit by an off-road motorcycle. The public prosecutor's office told the French press agency that the young girl suffered major head injuries, which, if she survives, will have heavy neurological consequences. The boy would have suffered fractures. Now, both of these children were hit by a motocross bike, and the rider was believed to have been taking part in a meetup of these urban dirt bike riders and performing stunts. An 18-year-old boy who had initially left the scene has actually handed himself in at the police station on the following day. And on Sunday at the weekend, he was said to being questioned by the police. Now, that's not the first instance of this kind with a serious consequence. Uh, in June, a 19-year-old died after he was hit by a motocross bike at an urban rodeo in the Brittany city of Rennes. Now, the incidents have led to fresh calls from politicians to clamp down on the illegal gatherings. The French President Emmanuel Macron, he passed a tough new law in 2018, which was aimed at heavy punishments for taking part in these events. So it's a long-standing problem, and riders can actually face up to five years in prison. Natalia Poutsereff, who is one of the lawmakers for Emmanuel Macron's centrist party Renaissance, she co-authored that 2018 law and she told uh, France if Info Radio on Sunday there must be a more systematic confiscation of these bikes. She said there should be more police interventions on the ground, more CCT coverage. And she said that if arrests were followed by prison sentences and more radical sanctions, they would have a dissuasive effect. Well, I think you know my opinion on how effective deterrence measures often are, so good luck with that. Right, now, a road legal bike that you're not likely to see so much of in the near future, of course, is the GSX-R Suzuki series. Now, they pretty much define sports bike performance for over 30 years, admittedly along with uh, you know offerings from Honda, Kawasaki and Yamaha. But somehow, I always felt that the GSX-R range was actually iconic. They have, have actually sold more than a million worldwide. I've owned one of those GSX-Rs myself, even if it was one of the less successful models. It was the 92 WN Series 750. Now, at the time, um, the sporting range of bikes sold here in the UK it ran from the lively and nimble 600 to the blisteringly quick 1100, which was quick for the time, but um, it was possibly the 
1000 cc which became the uh, the sort of figurehead for the whole gsxr range it's a highly sophisticated bike it's been highly successful on road and track too but it is pretty much the end of an era because right now on the uk website there's only one version of their former flagship machine listed and that's the gsxr 1000r phantom of which suzuki says the rider can own the roads and the racetrack and it claims the bike is the most exciting the most advanced gsxr in history well, the model soon will be history, unfortunately, rather than writing it. With Suzuki unable or unwilling to make the necessary modifications to the range to comply with the Euro 5 regulations, the bike will no longer be sold in Europe and the UK from 2023. So the only sports bike currently in the catalogue, apart from that GSXR 1000 Phantom, and I use the term advisedly because it is the 125 single GSXR 125, which barely rates the, the, the classification, frankly. Anyway, Euro 5, of course, came into force back in January 2021, but there was a derogation for two years to allow existing models to be continued for sale but that time obviously runs out at the end of this year and suzuki have now confirmed that the model will not be updated to meet the latest emission regulations now as it stands the us is lucky because they can still get the entire range of gsxrs from 600 through 750 to a thousand but with other countries around the world all ramping up their own emission rules markets are increasingly limited and even in the us california the state that for years actually set the bar for emissions in the usa they are about to enact legislation that will bring their own rules up to a level similar to euro 5 and where california leads other us states generally follow fairly quickly so that would put the nail in the coffin for US GSXR sales too. Now the Jixa 1000 is currently the only Japanese superbike which uses a mechanical variable valve timing system. And it seems Suzuki have actually filed patents for a more sophisticated variable valve timing system. And that has led to speculation that a brand new model could appear uh, to meet the next iteration of emission rules that will be euro 5 plus incidentally which is a revision to the current laws and that's due in from 2024 so is that likely well i'm not convinced i have to say suzuki have known about the emission regs for a long time but they've done little to update their range they've just pulled models from across the catalog right left and center the recent culprit uh, exaltations that motorcycles are not um something that suzuki are planning to drop does seem a tacit admission that the company has actually been caught on the hop somewhat by the recent change to uh, electric motorcycles and the sort of the uh, not just the swap by users which is gathering pace but also the sudden change in uh, legislation in many countries um so it's arguable Suzuki is one of the smaller bike manufacturers um, you know, in real terms. They have limited resources to plow into the development of a complete new range of ICE petrol engines. And just at a time when the Japanese are in fact looking to shift their ICE engines towards hydrogen. And whilst worldwide, there's obviously the push to the electric bikes. So if you ask me if we'll see a brand new ICE petrol engine powering a GSXR, I very much doubt it. Now, don't forget, if you do want to uh, catch this show, it goes out on Wednesdays and Sundays. It goes out at 11, almost always live, as today, even when on the holiday. Um, sometimes it goes out recorded, and very occasionally I miss a show uh, altogether. But uh, I'll give you a fair warning of that if I am not going to see one. And don't forget, if you want to see the whole series of 11s, as you can find them on my YouTube channel, Survival Schools UK. Now, um, of course, of the current crop of electric bikes, I would honestly say that many of them are not going to be a complete replacement for the ICE engine. I don't think anybody denies that. But one thing that I, I kind of feel is that the electric manufacturers are actually struggling a little bit to find a sweet spot where there is a combination of both range and performance. The 
Part of the problem that they have is that there is an obsession within motorcycling for horsepower, even when the vast majority of the power that a bike puts out can never, ever be used, as I've explained before. 10 horsepower roughly gets you to 60 miles now, 30 horsepower to 100, and you need about 100, and um, to get to 120, you need about 60 horsepower. So, you know, the, the, the bikes with vast amounts of power at the end of the day, most of that power is irrelevant. The really useful figure is thrust and that thrust is what the rear wheel um, delivers when the engine outputs at the torque is put through the sort of the multiplier or divider i suppose would be a more accurate term that is the final drive and one thing that electric bikes have is lots of torque so let's have a quick look at another electric motorcycle um, how about this one for example now that actually is a, i suppose it's a slightly weird looking bike but you can see what it's aimed at it's uh, aimed at the adventure market now this comes from an indonesian manufacturer called baron energy and this particular machine gets an electric motor with a not insubstantial 46.6 horsepower, which of course just happens to fall neatly into the A2 license category for Europe. Um, but it also gets 106 Newton meters, uh, around about 74 foot pounds of torque. Um, so whilst the engine pushes the bike to around 100 miles per hour flat out, it will get there fairly quickly. The problem really, as I see it, is that this bike, the Anubis Cruiser Cross, has a battery capacity of just 6.3 kilowatts hours. And that's pretty small by uh, sort of road bike standards. They claim a range of 82 miles on a single charge. And I would say that's not going to make much of an adventure. You're not going to find many charging points in the sand dunes that the bike is pictured in there. And if you try to ride at any kind of speed, my guess is that the range will drop off fairly significantly. You know, if you hack down the motorway on this thing, I would be surprised if you get much more than 30 odd miles. Anyway, it's fair, I think, to say then that this is an adventure bike in style only, uh, but it would be suitable for the short range commuter, particularly one who needs to travel for short distances at highway speeds and isn't just stuck in an inner urban crawl. Now, the bike gets a um, standard pattern of front forks, although I'm not clear on whether they're upside down or right way up because they're under that shroud. A monoshock rear end, uh, single discs, ABS isn't mentioned, but uh, probably uh, will be fitted as is mandatory in many markets these days and the instruments are the standard digital cluster you get led lights predictably and you get the handy storage compartment where the motorcycles fuel tank would normally be just like with the zeros as well as the wire wheels pictured here there appears to be a um, an alloy spoke option probably for sort of more urban use but there's no indication yet of pricing or even when the bike will appear uh, let alone whether it would be on sale in the uk so uh, it's as well i suspect that's um something that we probably won't see over here but i thought it'd be interesting to have a quick look at it so if there is one plus for electric bikes it's that it will put the skids under companies that continue to blur the line between legal and illegal exhaust now if you have followed this podcast uh, long enough webcast whatever it is um you'll know that i am no fan of loud exhaust systems the problem was exacerbated, of course, during lockdown when there were many bikes being used with illegal exhausts. And I won't name and shame, but um, I've just come across a piece of advertising for a brand new full exhaust system for a motorcycle. And again, I won't say what it is, but my first observation is that the bike the exhaust is for is not a popular track day bike. And it's certainly not one that anybody would take to the track to try to win races on. It's a road bike. The second thing is that although it promises sharper throttle response and increase in performance um, mostly these improvements are so tiny a uh, few riders will actually notice them um, but you do get what's called a generous dose of weight reduction well actually again a couple of kilos um, how many riders will actually notice that would they actually notice if they lost a few kilos while they were riding the bike because it would have the same effect question is how do they achieve the reduction and the answer is basically by chopping out the original equipment catalyst so effectively it's a um it becomes a 
and exhaust, which isn't road legal. But what they're advertising it as is approved for closed circuit use. Well, when I have not seen a standard that requires a particular exhaust system for closed circuit use. What I have seen are noise limits for particular tracks, but basically what they are meaning is that it's not a road legal exhaust, it's illegal. Um, and I, yeah, okay, I guess most people probably sort of see the difference between a approved for closed circuits and um, they would work out that what the advertising really means is it's not road legal but there'll be a few who probably are also confused by that statement and may think that it means that they can fit it to go on the track and it's perfectly all right for the road anyway whatever i still think that uh, the sooner we get rid of illegal exhausts the better um now um don't forget if you do enjoy the show you can head over to my coffee page and you can support me over there um three pounds buys me a coffee or um, half a pint of beer at the current rates um but it will also access for you you'll get access to hundreds of better biking articles um so do support me if you possibly can but enjoy the content when you do that there's plenty of free stuff on my coffee page by the way Oh, very quickly, on to the final bit that I want to talk about, and this is the Essex Police tweet that came out the other day. Now, I said that I thought Essex were, were entirely wrong to tweet to the um, uh, two-wheeler population that filtering is don't dangerous, don't do it. It obviously came under a lot of fire from motorcyclists and cyclists alike, um, and I got a lot of support, but um, I also got some uh, some criticism for my thinking now um robert actually told me that filtering against oncoming traffic should not be encouraged as it not only goes against the laws of the land and of common sense but of the ethos advanced riding now let's try and clear that up first of all first thing is when i talk about filtering there's some confusion over two things legality and terminology so let's get the first confusion out of the way we live in the uk we are allowed to filter that's not because we have a law permitting filtering but because we do not have a law making it illegal now some countries have a book of road rules that lays down what the locals there are allowed to do australia is a good example there are i think something over a thousand rule, road rules that you're supposed to know over there so there if it's not specifically allowed then you can't do it but the uk is different our rules state when something is not allowed therefore if there's no specific rule banning something it's legal and a good example for example of, of rules which do ban something are those banning mopeds and pedestrians from specific roads such as motorways and tunnels now second confusion the difference between filtering and lane splitting this is a terminology thing when i started working as a courier rather scary that's uh, 40 plus years ago no one had actually heard the term lane splitting it simply didn't exist and that's because it's a transatlantic piece of terminology i only heard about it when i joined the internet and got onto an international forum and then discovered that the americans use it to refer to riding along between lanes of vehicles that are actually traveling in the same direction so for instance on the american equivalent of a motorway a sort of freeway or a highway which has a barrier down the middle so lane splitting is legal in some states in the us notably california the filtering is the broader catch-all term because it includes lane splitting in the uk as well as overtaking slower moving traffic either to the right of that traffic or to the left the near side in the uk of course so lane splitting is essentially a subset of filtering and they are all forms of overtaking so next question is it legal to filter against oncoming vehicles my critic initially argued it was actually only legal to filter if nothing was coming the other way now again i simply don't agree the road rules don't say that so i would say that filtering against oncoming traffic is not illegal per se um we can refer to a an authority like roadcraft for example but the trouble is roadcraft gives no real advice on where or where not to do it but common sense tells us that filtering 
is a form of overtaking and therefore the same general rules of filtering should be applied and basically that, that general rule is safety for us the rider and for other road users so at that point robert kind of modified his argument a bit to say that police would take a dim view of filtering against oncoming traffic well again i don't fully agree it largely depends how we do it i said that if the road were wide enough i'd be happy to filter against oncoming traffic and indeed i did that regularly as a courier and robert came back with another question who will decide then if it's okay or not well there's a simple and easy way to answer that as well and it's actually back to the basic rule that underpins the entire highway code which to paraphrase it says we shouldn't by our actions make another road user change speed or direction to avoid us so if we can pass between opposing lanes of traffic without making other road users change speed or direction then i would say that filtering even in the face of oncoming traffic is okay so what we're looking for really is sufficient clearance to make sure that we don't force others to swerve and we keep the speed down so that we don't put ourselves at undue risk. And I'd say that there are plenty of roads in the UK where it's perfectly possible to straddle the centre lane, even pass into the other lane and still pass safely between streams of traffic. Um, and I mentioned Regent Street as a possible example for it. That would be one from my history. I would also say if the road's not wide enough and we're forcing drivers to actually have to physically move aside to make our way down the lanes of opposing traffic, then we have to be a damn sight more careful. And if we are physically barging through those streams, forcing drivers out of the way, then it's not just legally unacceptable, it's highly risky too. So if somebody doesn't make space for us, then we are hung out to dry and we've no way out of trouble. And I'd say there's a world difference between making your way through an available space and barging through making a space for yourself. But if you ask me where the big risk of filtering outside a stream of traffic lies, I would say that it's not from the stream of oncoming vehicles facing us because those drivers can actually see us coming. The things I'd be looking out for would be pedestrians and vehicles coming from my left through the queue across me because they are likely to be in my blind spot and me to be in their blind spot because of the vehicles I'm passing. But it's also the vehicles I'm driving past who might be about to turn right in front of me. Now, we all know that drivers don't see motorcycles coming in mirrors. It's not or nearly as easy as many of us think it is to spot a, a filtering motorcycle. Um, you only need to come up behind a van that's at a slight angle and you won't actually be visible at all in a mirror. So <coughs> that would be my main thinking. That would be where my attention will be focused. Vehicles turning out from the left, pedestrians crossing road, possibly even cyclists, and vehicles passing me turning right and a subset of oncoming vehicles turning through the traffic across our path who may not have seen us because they are focused on looking for the gap so i won't try to kid anybody that filtering is safe um you know there are these people who say do it right and nothing can go wrong nonsense there's always something that can go wrong but the amount what we actually do is what loads the dice either in our favor or against us um, same basic risk management principles apply if you we're lane splitting i mean the, one of the problems with lane splitting is that you hear people say it's safe if you're only going 10 15 20 miles per hour fast than other traffic no that's not correct it isn't if you are filtering through or lane splitting past stationary traffic at 50 miles per hour there is no way that you're going to avoid an open door or someone stepping out from behind a vehicle. And the same applies when lane splitting at 70 on a fast moving motorway. I've seen people doing that. They simply don't realize how far back they are committed to a maneuver from. There's very little time to take evasive action. So is there one area where I'd be particularly cautious and generally would advise people not to 
uh, lane split or filter? And yes, the answer is when we're passing on the near side of traffic, so on the left in the UK. And I'd say really that's a place where everybody who is passing up the inside of a queue has to be cautious not just motorcycles bicycle riders electric pedal cycles and the uh, electric step scooters too and the reason it's more risky of course is that because it's harder to check the near side mirror you've got to actually look right across the vehicle to do that and people tend to forget they tend to forget there'll be even you know in london people tend to forget there are vehicles coming up the near side of them they'll tend to look on the right mirror for overtaking vehicles and still forget the left mirror unfortunately with the growth in cycling i have noticed that drivers are more and more and more moving across the lane and hugging the center line down the middle of the road these days and that means more and more riders are actually using the near side to filter because there is actually a bigger gap on that side. And though I haven't actually seen a collision yet, I have seen uh, riders having to take some very, very abrupt action to avoid uh, vehicles who have turned left because they've not seen them. So let's try and wrap up. Filtering and lane splitting are legal. There are risks, but they're almost all predictable risks, and we can adapt to do what we can to minimize those risks. And I would say that frankly, Essex Police would have been far more sensible to have put out an even-handed tweet asking two-wheeler riders to consider the risks and keep the speed down, and to drivers to remember that there are vulnerable road users who will be making use of their mobility in heavy traffic to pass vehicles on both sides. Um, what I think was still demonstrably wrong is saying that riders of whatever ilk shouldn't filter because it's dangerous and frankly if you think you're safe on a bike before you're sat uh, because you're sat stationary in a queue think again here's a little story for you a friend of mine very good friend of mine was actually knocked off her motorcycle when she was stationary in a queue by a pedestrian the pedestrian ran into the gap looking the wrong way on um she was looking for vehicles coming up fast from her right and what she hadn't seen was that there was actually a bike right in front of her she ran full tilt into the bike my friend toppled off to the right predictably and she was very lucky because what she landed behind was a traffic island um had she been on a standard bit of road she would have actually ended up straddling the white line as she fell with her head on the wrong side of it um so she was very lucky where she actually fell off um and that's can happen when you're stationary so yes the police have a vested interest in reducing road casualties i wouldn't deny that but i would say that education and not simply a bald statement of do or don't do is the right way forward um there's always ways to argue with a bald don't do statement like that so as i said last time out and i stick by it i still think the message from essex was wrong okay so a couple of comments um kevin says good point everything is legal except that which is illegal and yeah he also goes on to say that uh, riding shouldn't be cared is inconsiderate or dangerous and that's exactly what i would say don't make other people uh, change direction or speed to avoid you if you're doing that you're liable to fall foul not only of putting yourself at risk but also of those careless dangerous uh, driving charges he also says breaches of highway code rules uh, might be well they are used to support the prosecution yes so if you do something that it says don't do it in the highway code uh, you could be in trouble and uh, christine says i often filter using common sense and local road sign guidance yes uh, exactly it yeah okay so that wraps up today um i've gone on a little bit longer than i expected um partly due to a bit of a technical problem with my virtual background which uh, i failed to get working this morning uh, after it worked perfectly just a few days ago um edge appears to have updated itself and that i suspect is the problem anyhow uh, thank you very much again for looking in uh, i'm kevin williams this was my 11s is show next one will be due out on sunday do look in if you possibly can and don't forget those events which are coming up over the next month or so 
um if you are out there on the bike today it looks like another lovely day a bit hot inland it's a beautiful cooling breeze here on the kent coast um so i'm now looking forward to getting out and having another day of listening to music around and about but if you are out there on your bike do stay shiny side up <laughs> 